All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome into now what is our fourth ever Ask Me Anything on the City of Minot budget today. Of course, we're answering your questions about the City Council President's recommended budget for 2023. If you missed our first three AMAs, that was with city staff. You can go ahead and go back to your favorite social media page and find all of those. My name, Derek Hackett. I'm your public information officer with the city and joining me now on our journey of information is our city council president, uh, Alderman Paul Pittner. Hey, Paul. Hey, Derek. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining all of us and making some uh, time to answer maybe some questions from the people about the 2023 budget. Um, it was introduced earlier in August. You had a chance to submit your budget message and recommendation to council on August 15th. Uh, hopefully some people have got a little bit of a better idea of what that might include. We are going to take some time to answer some questions. So if you guys are watching and you have a question for Paul, drop it in the comment section. We'll try our very best to kind of add all that in as we try to bring Paul back here. Fading the black on me, making me nervous. Um, we're going to take about 45 minutes today uh, for these questions. It may, it, it may be longer. It might be uh, less time. It all depends on the kind of engagement from the public. I see we have about 19 people jumping on live right here. So without further ado, Paul, let's start with this uh, madhouse of questions that we have for you. And what I really want to focus on to begin this is the changes um, from what we learned about the 2023 budget as uh, proposed by the city manager earlier in August to what you have proposed now, uh, our working draft that we're actually working off of now as uh, city council president. Um, originally, the 2023 budget had about 23 positions asked for 2023. Uh, you uh, removed two of those in your recommendation, a drug task force officer and a property maintenance employee designated for kind of the downtown properties like the parking structures and city hall. So, uh, Paul, what was sort of our rationale behind removing those two positions from your recommended budget? Oh, let's bring you back real quick here. That's show business. All right. You still with us? Yep. I can hear you. Okay. Did you get that question? We're, we're yep. talking about the two added positions or removal of two requested positions from the 2023 20, budget. Looking for your rationale on removing the uh, drug task force officer and the property maintenance employee. Yeah. Um, let's start with property maintenance employee. Um, one of the one of the justifications, and there's a number of them uh, for these positions, and my mindset going into this process um, in regards to staff, it, it's very easy to grow staff, to grow our um, uh, staff, it's, it's once they're in place, it, it's hard to shrink the size of government. Um, so I, I take new positions. And when we had our council retreat at the Carnegie hall with department heads, one of my number one priorities for our department heads was give the tools that are needed by staff that we currently have to be successful, to find efficiencies. Um, and, and I was reluctant to, to any new staff positions to be quite frank, However, the reality is we, we are a growing community and there are some that are absolutely 100% needed. Um, when we talk about the property maintenance, one of the justifications was got a couple new buildings coming online. City Hall, no doubt um, gonna need more manpower to, to cover that. Um, fire Station 5 is another one. Um, the, the, the unique thing about Fire Station 5 is when those firefighters are on staff, a lot of them take care of the maintenance, the, the mowing, the, the snow removal, um, cleaning of the facility, um, Chief, uh, the fire chief does a great job of, of uh, keeping those those guys busy and, and engaged. Um, the other one was the one of the other um, ideas was the um, the parking structures downtown. I don't think the city has had enough of a conversation um, as far as leadership um, among the council, among the community, on what we're going to do with those parking structures. Obviously, we're putting in a new bus stop downtown, which I think is a great addition. Uh, we might look to sell one of those now that we're through the majority of the uh, the legal process there. Um, if not all of it, we can start to look to get those online and get those activated for our community and really fulfill what they were um, meant to be from the get go. You know, a lot of people talk about the parking structures and say, just tear them down. It's not going to happen. They're, they're there. They can be used as an asset. Uh, we got to look at a glass half full. So whether or not those are under the city's purview a year from now, two years from now, to, to commit more staff to and justify more staff with them being uh, a, a part of the uh, the equation, I don't know if they will be. So that was my my thought to challenge staff. Let's find some efficiencies with the staff we have, and and in the next budget cycle, if we still have those online and we we really need the position, 
I'm open to to considering it uh, next go around. Um, as far as the drug task force officer, um, drug task force is, a, is, is is an organization that if if the chief wanted to appoint someone to that uh, that drug task force, he can absolutely do that. He'll be taking a, an officer off the streets putting them uh, with drug task force, and that we would be uh, essentially hiring a new patrol officer, new entry-level officer to replace that officer that would go to task force, which, again, if I, I, I'm fully supportive of uh, the drug task force and the work that they do. We have roughly 10 positions between open positions and resignations and retirements coming this year to fill above and beyond uh, another added police officer position. So are they understaffed? Absolutely. Um, by just adding the position, there's no guarantee that it'll be filled. There's no guarantee that that will provide any sort of um, um, alleviated pressure on our on our uh, uh, current uh, staff in the police department. And and again, we'll get into that a little bit later. I'm sure some of the questions that'll come in um, as far as, as some of the rationale for that. But I, again, I think we have other issues that we can solve before adding more positions. I think we need to become more efficient. I need to think we need to, to look at maybe retention and recruitment efforts before we just add another position, um, if that answers the question. Well, yeah, and it kind of leads to the next one. On It was last Monday at the meeting. There was a lot of conversation about this and um, a, a recommendation of pot potentially removing two um, police officers from the budget that are currently budgeted. Now, there was conversation, and you alluded to this, there are some unfulfilled positions um, at the moment. Um, can you tell us more about the recommendation of removing two officers from 2023's budget? Yeah, so like I, like I said, there's about roughly 10 open positions within the police department that, that'll be on the plate for, um, for city to fill this year, this fiscal year. Um, my recommendation was to remove the drug task force requested position, which essentially is an officer position and two other officer positions um, that are currently budgeted for. And with that cost saving, um, my was, I don't think we're really doing anything by budgeting for those positions. Yes, it, the comment was made that that sends the wrong message for our the police department or our, our staff. But with those cost savings, my recommendation is to take those cost savings and place it and set it aside for future improvements and or a new building for the police department. Because, Derek, the reality is when City Hall relocates to downtown, that's going to open a little bit more room at the current City Hall location for the police department to expand, which they desperately need. You know, one of the things that our city manager has implemented since coming aboard is budget tours. So in March and April, we go and we tour these departments. And outside of staffing, staffing issues with the police department, the number one issue that is just pounded into our heads is that the building and the current space that they have is not conducive for the city of Minot police department. So my mindset was instead of lying to ourselves and kidding ourselves that we're going to be able to fill those positions this year, and maybe we do. And if we do, I'm, I'm, I'm all supportive of it. And, and I was very clear at council that if those remaining positions are filled, I have I will give full support to a budget amendment to to post new positions, which is something I'm not willing to do for any department outside of the police department. That if there is an unless it's completely justified, but we want to set funds aside for a problem that we know the community is going to be facing. We want to be proactive. If I want to buy a house, a bigger house, the first thing my wife and I need to start doing is saving money. You need to start saving money. Um, you know, Derek, we all hear the rumblings. We all hear the the, the, the feedback from, from citizens. Um, and, and it's our job as council members to be, you know, liaisons to the community because we, we are a wealth of knowledge and information of what's going on in the city. We hear about the heartburn sometimes of City Hall being moved downtown. Well, that's a, that's a project that's funded – majority from federal grant dollars yes they're tax dollars but it's it's not a local lift 100 percent. when we plan to do something for the police department which we will have to do whether it's renovate the building that we're they're currently in expand it go to a new location right now that's that's on the back of taxpayers that's on the back of you and i as taxpayers to 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 make sure that they have the tools to be successful you know right now they've they've got a lot of things that i would consider liabilities in in there um as far as 
the locker rooms not being sufficient sizes, outdated equipment. Um, again, a, a number of things that I think can be can be addressed if we start saving today. And we're gonna we're really gonna be thankful that we start saving today instead of when we get the study back, uh, a space analysis study, and we find out we find out that hey, it's gonna cost eight million bucks to save this. Well, hopefully we've got two million dollars in the bank saved up. And we don't have to come to the, the citizens for, for one big um, ask, if you will, um, on the back of taxpayers. So, again, I just try to be proactive. And, and, again, the police department, I fully support. If they are able to fill their positions and their open positions and they become fully staffed, we told Chief, bring us a budget amendment. He has, he has the support. It's on a public record that myself and the other council members will 100% support that, uh, support that ask for more staff members. Um, but in, in the event that those, those positions aren't, aren't fulfilled, that money's not going to just roll over into the general fund unallocated. I want to start allocating money it's going to be a real issue for citizens um, no matter what. It's just a matter of time. Sort of pivoting from a department specific question and, and looking more globally, this is actually something that came um, from our online submission earlier today. I'll take a little liberties with, with how I asked the questions, but uh, for some people, they may have received their property tax notice today in the mail. Now that can be jarring um, just about every year, despite what uh, taxing entities are going through. Now it's important to remember that City Minot is a, just one of four pieces on that property tax statement, but uh, regardless, we are a piece of that. The question is from Donna uh, is her name. And I apologize, Donna, I didn't grab your last name. Um, when the city manager proposed his budget early in August, he said that we found out that there were some savings from health care, about 2% savings from the year prior. Um, will that savings from that 2% employee health care premium um, decrease be used for property tax relief? This is a question from Donna. And, and, and Dave and Harold can can jump in on this too if, if they want. But no, um, those cost savings are going to be. We're not going to see those cost savings year after year. Um, that was a, that was a wonderful gift um, to to um, to us as, as an organization. But what we're going to do is, you know, again, we're putting some of that money back into road maintenance. We're putting some of that money into cost savings. Um, we can't lie to ourselves. Another thing that was that was mentioned to. Um, to department heads and staff to give direction. We can't lie to ourselves what it costs to run government. We can't lie to ourselves what it costs to to um, to fund the city and, and, and provide the services that we provide. We look at what's going on um, you know, globally with with wars overseas and, 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 and inflation and, and, and setbacks and um, backlogs in, in ordering parts and, and things to do projects. Um, we need to be proactive and we need to, to, to again be honest with ourselves to what it costs to run the city um and again that's that's not something that we're going to see year after year and we're going to be very diligent with those savings and and try to put it to future use um but dave and dave and harold can can elaborate on that if they want yeah paul mentions we do have our uh, city manager harold stewart um here with us as well just sort of a a supporting role for our city council president and it sounds like he's calling you from the bullpen here harold have anything to add to this question yeah, I mean, ultimately, the, the, that decision is, is based on what the council wants to do. We did provide a lot of alternatives and things that they could consider. Uh, we have a multitude of projects and investments that can be made on behalf of the community, including some things that were identified in the community survey, some things that we haven't had funding to get to yet. Um, but ultimately, you know, the decision as far as where property tax is going to sit on whether they take the moderate minimal increase of the 1.48 mills that was proposed in my budget, or whether they want to uh, keep the mill levy flat or even decrease it potentially uh, with that savings. Uh, that's, uh, that's a decision for the council to make as the elected officials of the constituency of the citizens uh, across the community. So um, uh, I think Alderman Pittner just gave his opinion with regards to that. Uh, staff moves at the speed in the direction of the majority of the council. And that'll be something that'll be deliberated here, I imagine, over the next a few special council meetings and as they have the um, first readings and adoption process of the budget here before the first meeting in October. So again, it's always a good time for citizens to be engaged with their council and uh, make their voices heard and, and uh, let the council make that decision on behalf of the community. All right. All right. Thanks, Harold. Uh, we'll put him back in our pocket for later, Paul. Um, 
Yeah, as, as Harold mentioned, this is just a piece of the process. A long road ahead before we even adopt a 2023 budget. budget. This is all just a, a preliminary um, piece of this whole budget, budget process. Now, City Manager uh, Harold Stewart did put forth a recommendation earlier in August to add 1.48 mills to the budget. That's included 14 positions against property taxes, as we mentioned a few of those before, as well as $2 million in additional um, funding for street maintenance. With your recommendation, Paul, you kept that mill increase and added, uh, and that added $2 million for streets. Plus, you found uh, another half a million dollars to put towards street maintenance. What was the motivation that you had to increase the investment in the maintenance of city streets? With some of the cost savings, I was able to um, pull out of the budget from my recommendation. I put that in there because that's what citizens wanted. That was that was from our community survey. That was the number one, um, one of the top priorities that that citizens want to see is improved road and street maintenance. Um, so again, we have been told from from our outside analysts and from our engineering department, in order to maintain the quality that we want to in streets, we need about twelve million dollars in that um, in that fund every year. Um, so we're we've made great strides in that direction, but this is this is 100% from citizens. This is something that they wanted. I feel like this is a priority, so that's why I felt comfortable moving that extra five hundred thousand dollars to to help close that gap um, and, and and get to a uh, a um, reasonable um, and acceptable level of, of of quality roads in our city. So. And with that, just for context, that bumps us up from about $5 million this year to $7.5 million proposed for the 2023 budget. Now, something else you added into the budget for 2023 was a replenishment, if you will, of the facade improvement program, uh, as well as for phase one of a wayfinding signage program for downtown and the surrounding areas. This all comes from a portion of sales tax, but why did you feel this was important to include in the 2023 budget? It goes back to when I first got on council, the IEDC report, International Economic Development Committee came to Minot, did a report, um, did a study to kind of help us, to nudge us and give us some some suggestions um, into making our, our, our city and our, our downtown, our business community more provide more synergy and, and just a better ecosystem, if you will. This is one of those deliverables that was recommended. It was a wayfinding signage. It, was, it went through a committee. Um, it was presented to council. The funding came to us. Um, the, the, the funding requirements came to us. And my mindset is if we don't start it now, the further we push some of these projects off, the more less likely they are to become because other things come um, above and beyond those. You mentioned this. This is sales tax. This is a portion of the first penny of sales tax, 15% of the first penny of sales tax um, that's allocated to economic development. This is not, if, if we don't spend this money on wayfinding, this, this is not what precludes us from funding more firefighter positions or police officer positions. This is economic development funds. Um, and, you know, we even had a member of council that said, you know, this, some of this stuff, you know, I, I like the signage, it, it, it's good. And, I think it it, it provide or it contributes to the city and the beautification of the city, um, but it just seems grandiose. I don't know if we need that. And my response to that is, yeah, we do. We deserve nice things too in Minot. You know, we're a hub city. We we service the industry and, and service the region, whether it's for medical needs or shopping or groceries. We are a hub, and and we need to stand up and be proud and 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 take good care of our city and and make it make it a place where people do want to be. Um, so I, investing in the beautification, just like someone does to their home, just their own personal home, whether it be landscaping or, or painting their house, upkeep is important. And, and again, the fancy signage and, and this, that, that, that people kind of cast it aside or, and it's not for us. In a lot of ways, I say it's not for us. It's for the people that aren't from Minot, the students that come to our university, the people that are touring for jobs. Um, we want them to come and, when I went to college, the advice that was given to me was just drive around and get lost. Put your phone down and drive around and get lost. 
open your eyes and see what's out there. So I think this provides an opportunity for people when they do come to our community, they can still be, it can still be interactive and they can still be engaged um, when they're driving the streets, whether it be downtown or off the interstate or, or, or whatever it is. So, so again, I think that's why it's important to me is that if we don't fund these things today, it's, it's harder to find that funding later on down the road. Paul, how does the facade improvement program kind of fit in with that overall um, idea you have? You mentioned we're allowed to have nice things. How does that program kind of meld with this, um, the sales tax dollars that we're using for this kind of program? Again, thanks for the segue, Derek. Sales tax dollars. These are sales tax dollars that are allocated uh, for these functions. It's, it's, a, it's a program that we're, we're getting through the first year. I feel we're starting to see some of the facades come to life downtown. Um, some of the buildings that are that are being put back together, the exteriors um, reclaim um, original natural beauty, if you will, that aren't covered up and 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 whatnot. Um, with that being said, you know some people say well, you're you're spending you know sales tax dollars to help these these business owners. Yeah, but we're also giving contractors work. We're also giving um, engineers work to, to to do these things to beautify our city to get these buildings back and activated downtown, generating tax dollars, generating sales tax dollars. These it's just a tool in the toolbox, if you will, for some of these these pop property owners downtown um, and incentivize them to invest in their community and invest in themselves. So uh, again, I, I think it's um. I think it's important that we give as many tools as possible. You couple that with the Renaissance Zone. You couple that with um, the flex pace to the state of North Dakota. Some of these programs that can really um, bolster economic development within our community. And, and again, I don't want anyone to think that I don't care about any other areas of town. Um, but we have to have a centralized, focused um, effort before we can really expand these programs and expand them citywide or uh, Renaissance zone, or we'll take a block at a time and, and move them as we complete projects. So uh, it's one of the, another one of the things that came out of the IADC report was that the city has to take a more proactive and active role in economic, economic development. We have some great partners, whether it be the Chamber EDC, Visit Minot, Service Basin Planning Council. Um, uh, we have a lot of great partners uh, with us in the city and we as a city can uh can carry some of that load as well and we have some some deliverables and some some tasks that we can pick up and carry the city further and and again i I've said it before i said at our last council meeting i said it in my president's letter we're the fourth largest community in north dakota and it's time we start acting like it and investing in ourselves and, and dang it it's it's we deserve nice things too so that, that's my mindset on it. I, I, and the program's been in place for a year. We've had a lot of applications. I sit on the Renaissance Zone uh, Review Committee as, as a liaison to the council. We have a lot of applications that have come through that have been approved and are starting the process. So again, I, I hate to implement some of these programs and then pull them only a year into it. We have to be steadfast. And we have to make sure that we maintain an effort in these areas so that as soon as we get some momentum behind it. We don't lose it by pulling funding. So that's my mindset is that we need to just eyes on the prize and, 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 and forge ahead. So. Now, I hope uh, some of that satisfied Connie Samuelson's first part of her question about um, the facade improvement program. And if you're not familiar with this program, we do have two buildings downtown that are uh, currently under construction, utilizing that program, um, one on Main Street and one, I think, is um, east of there on First Street. So there is activity going on with that. I suppose that is why you wanted to replenish some of those funds, Paul. Just real quick, Derek, just to add on Please. to that, just, um, Mouse River Players um, is having their building, um, utilizing the, the facade improvement program, Margie, Margie's Art Glass Studio, uh, redoing the exterior of their building, um, the... I, the one you said on first, uh, the big M building will also be able to take advantage of this to couple with getting that dilapidated zombie building, if you will, back online, generating property tax, generating sales tax, getting people living and working downtown. So again, these are these aren't this isn't a magic wand, but there, there's no economic development tool that's a magic wand that we wave and all of a sudden we breathe new life into these businesses or these areas of Minot. It's a process and we have to stick to the process um, in order to, 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 to reap the reward. So that's that's my mind thing is that every in the day in which we live in instant gratification to get back to to. Working the process uh, for years 
really um, to see the benefits that we're going to see. So pulling back from the kind of the granular conversation here, Paul, after you were presented with the budgets, I don't know, early August, I think it was the second or something like that. Um, was there anything that stood out to you as what you would consider was the biggest need for MyNet as we prepare for, prepare for 2023? What kind of just popped out to you as far as being the city council president uh, and this budget as we move forward to next year? Well, again, one of the, one of the things that I'm trying to allocate funds to um, would be the police department issues. Um, you know, again, we walk through those budget them. It's really hammered home to us that that building as it sits is not conducive to the current functions um, of our police department. We need to either expand, we either need to remodel, or we need to move all together. So when I see those issues and, and what kind of financial commitment that's going to be and what, fi what financial strain that's going to be on taxpayers, that's why I want to start saving today um, for that future issue. Um, coupled with, you know, what we saw this past year with inflation, fuel costs, you know, when we see fuel budgets, you know, we're budgeting for, for, for fuel or gas at, you know, three fifty a gallon and, and we're paying $5 a gallon. Um, you know, those are just some of the factors that we can't control. Um, so, so again, I think those are the biggest issues that, that stand out to me. And, and a lot of that is the unknowns. I mean, that's the scary part of these budgets. We we budget. We try to be conservative, and we try to try to keep it as as, as tight knit as possible. And and our and our staff does a good job of that. But um, there's also some things that are just 100% out of our control. So you mentioned trying to um, balance um, these budgets with you know all the things that we need to do, but we can't fit everything into a single year's budget. I, I mean, we have an engineering and public works staff that would like to do all of all of the street maintenance today and all the flood control today. It's just not feasible. It's not rea uh, reality. Um, that leaves me to my next question, Paul. What what type of programs, projects, or initiatives uh, do you wish to see? in the future, but we just couldn't have in the 2023 budget? That's a tough question, Derek, because you don't that's know That's what, what I'm here for, know. the tough and questions. That's, that's what I do. But that yeah, that's the reality because we don't know what we don't, what we have or what we could use. And, and that's, you know, again, I'd love to put more money towards street maintenance. I'd love to put more money towards the future police department. I'd love to have more staff. Um, those are the big things. I think the programs that we're starting to do um, and the efforts that we're seeing from outside investment, whether it be, you know, using a, a, a TIF for downtown, using a TIF for future developments. Um, those are the things that I'm excited for. Those are the things that might not. And and again, it, it can be stressful and it can be a, a learning curve for some of us. Um, but those are the big things. Growing the pie. We always talk about infill. We talk about, you know, we have Minot and there's only so many dollars to go around. Absolutely. And, and so you're very mindful and we as, as, as elected officials, as well as staff, I know are very cognizant that you can't take something that's not there. You can't, you can't, you can't use funds that we don't have. So they're very diligent in that sense. So what my goals are is to not necessarily take more, ask for more, do more. We need to grow the pie, right? We need to grow the city. We need to grow the tax base. And we're starting to see that with the, the developments that, that's going up on around the new high school, which I think is a great thing. I think that's going to see a lot of benefit from that. You see a lot of benefit from what's happening in Southwest Minot with uh, the new Trinity campus and, and the development that's starting to go on out there. So again, I'm open for any ideas and that that's why it's so important for someone to be engaged. That's why it's so important for for citizens to be engaged, just to new perspectives and open our eyes to to ideas that we may have not never had, um, that staff may have never had, um, in order to, to to bring forth growth in our community and and make us a more resilient community. So, how do you? Um, so the city council has set forth uh, four different Magic City aspirations: are dynamic. Um, um, res resilient and prepared, um, dynamic and prosperous, um, uh, safe and welcoming and excellent and connected. Those are the four pillars of which everything is kind of built upon, set forth by the council yourself. How do you, how do you see this budget fitting into those four different magic city aspirations? 
we can always do better, right? We can always we can always do better. I'm sure, I'm sure there's there's things that I've missed. I'm sure there's things that staff have missed that it's just it's just natural. We're not perfect, um, and everybody's gonna have a different opinion. So maybe maybe somebody thinks I did a perfect job, and if they did, just put it in the, the staff did a perfect job. Put it in the comments. Uh, but the reality is we all have a different uh, a different opinion, and that's why we're all up there. That's why we have seven different individuals up there that we can we can go at it and, and try to make it fit as best into these aspirations as we have, you know, dynamic and prosperous. We're, we need to grow the community. We need to invest in the people that are here. Um, we, we would love outside recruitment and outside business to come in, but I'm, I'm concerned and, and interested in investing in the businesses and, and the inv individuals that are already here, you know, resilient, pre prepared, you know, let's, okay, let's, let's put more money into our, let's get that caught up. You know, we we need more money for, um, the police department that's going to be a real issue facing us in the next few years so that we can maybe that maybe that lends itself to to better recruitment and retention saying hey i'm working in a, in a state-of-the-art brand new facility and and i want to stay here for my career um safe and welcoming well, well hey we've got um some some really great plans for some uh whether it be facade improvement or or some wayfinding signage that's really going to beautify our city and connect us and make us uh, uh just have a, a better connect excellent connected again we're working with all of our partners. We're working with citizens, you know, connected. The individuals that are leaving comments here, whether they're supportive or not, whether they have questions or not, whether they're, they approve or not, they're engaging at least. They're getting some bit of information, whether it be for myself or staff, that allow them to to make sure that they have the correct facts and they're they're aware of the challenges that not only staff face, but that we as council members stay face and, and and those are the challenges that we have to balance those are the challenges that we have to uh that we have to account for um when making these decisions so so again i think i think staff did a great job i really think staff did a really good job of, of bringing forth a budget when you talk about you know the hundreds of millions of dollars that that we manage in this budget and i'm making a fraction of a change um, in, in the grand scheme of things. And, and I might not have full support from some staff. I might not have some full support from the community, but I've done what I feel is setting us up as a community for future success to the best of my ability. Um, and, 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 and I think that's the best we can do. So I think the council did a really good job. I think staff did a really good job of, of hitting the aspirations and it's a great guiding, guiding light um, for future, uh, future budgets. Uh, now, the process isn't over with, Paul. You've delivered your president's message. Your obligation is over, but the work is still to come. In fact, um, you and your colleagues on the council have added three additional meetings coming up. One is this Wednesday at five o'clock with budget workshops. Very similar to some of these AMAs um, we've done here as far as structuring the content. Three different um, workshops, one on public safety, one on public works and street, and one on general government. As the council president, do you have any expectations on what we can expect with these three meetings as you you and your colleagues try to work through this budget process and get us ready and in our best position for 2023? Um, I think that's I think that's it. 2023. When I think of this budget and I think of the work that's gone into this from budget meetings and budget tours in March to our council workshop at the Carnegie Hall, um, with department heads, with 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 leadership in the city, um, this is just my opinion. This is my opinion, Derek, and I don't speak for anyone else on council. And I say this, but in my opinion, is is wrapped up. I, I feel comfortable and confident in this budget. I think what my expectations are of this meeting, of these meetings going forward, is that how can we do this process better? How can we have um, better communication through um, department heads to, to council members so everyone feels included, so everyone feels like their voices are heard. Um, can we condense that process? Can we can we shuffle some things around so that council members feel like they have more input into the president's letter? Um, so so again, I, I, that's, that's, that's where my mind is. My mind is on 2023. How can we make better what I feel is a really good process right now, what we did in this year's budget, how can we make that process better for next year? Um, and there might be some tweaks. There might be some recommendations. I fully expect that from council members that feel like their constituency wasn't maybe fully represented in this, um, in this budget or in some of the recommendations. And that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to have that, um, that, 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 um, that conversation. But again, I think staff did a really good job with this budget um, that was presented. I made 
very few changes in the grand scheme of things. And, um, and again, I, I look forward to those meetings and, and I just, I expect them to be cordial conversation between council members. So. Now I'm not seeing a lot of, um, questions rolling on through the comment section. Connie did have a number two to her question. I think that's probably more appropriate from a staff perspective to answer on that on snow removal and street cleaning as far as if, uh, ways to improve or anything like that. You can take a stab if you want, Paul, but that's really more of a, a management I'll, I'll leave that for one Dan. for staff. Yeah, we'll, we'll get with Connie. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that um, for you maybe offline. I'll get with Dan Jonas in to see if we have any insight on that. Um, so with that, unless we have anything else from the people watching live here, uh, I would open it up to you, Paul, if you have anything else you'd like to add regarding the 2023 budget. I really don't have anything to add. Uh, like I said, Derek, I, in my, my opinion, this budget process is wrapping up. I feel we, we've got a good product in front of us. We're, we're, we're addressing needs and issues that are coming, um, coming to face the city. We're, we're, we're preparing ourselves to the best of our ability and trying to be mindful of, of taxpayers' um, ability to, to they come. We're trying to collaborate with the other entities, as you said, that are part of the tax bill, the county, the school board, the park board. Um, to improve the quality of life for our citizens. And, and that's that's always my goal. Uh, my goal is to make it so that I my kids don't do what I did when I graduated high school. Um, I couldn't hit the edge of town fast enough. Um, I got out of here and, and eventually I came back. And, and my goal is to make this community set up for future successes. I want people to talk about how great mine it is. I, 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 I just think that, that again, we have so much opportunity within the city right now. And if I were to have any message to leave people with is be engaged. If you don't like something, come to a meeting, educate yourself, um, educate, educate your friends. Um, again, we, we get a lot of information in, in, in the comments section uh, in some of our meetings and, and a lot of it's just uneducated opinion um, because not all the facts are known. So again, I, I just encourage people to to attend these meetings, ask for the information, ask the questions, and and you'll get the answers. You'll get them um, unfiltered and and 100. Um, percent I'm, I'm always 100 percent happy to uh, uh, to answer somebody's questions when they have them in regards to the budget. So so again, that that's that's my biggest thing is is um, engage engage. Uh, Engage in the city, engage in your leadership, engage in your department heads, engage in your city staff, uh, because they're the they're the uh, they're the go tos on it. So that's what I've got, Derek. And, and if somebody else has got something else, I'll I'll, I'll be happy to answer it. Uh, I think we're dwindling down down on time. We did a pretty good job of filling up the forty five minutes. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time, Paul. Uh, remind everybody that this is was our, our final ask me anything regarding the 2023 budget. Work's not done. The information's not done. Three separate budget workshop meetings are coming to you. We will be broadcasting those as well from City Hall. The first one is Wednesday at 5 o'clock. Uh, that's August 24th, 5 o'clock. Um, and if anybody um, wants to um, reach out to Paul or any of his colleagues, you can do that. All their contact information is on the, the city um, website. I do have a line from our finance director before we go, though. He has volunteered as tribute, David Lakefield, coming in to just help with Connie Samuelson's question um, about, are our snow removal and street cleaning projects done with the most efficiency, or could we look at ways to improve? Dave has decided he wants to take this one head on. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Uh, looks like there's actually a couple of street related questions there. So maybe I can touch on both of them. Um, the, the snow removal portion of the street maintenance uh, budget, you know, it, it's a it, it's a guessing game. We can't budget and equip and staff uh, have enough people on hand for, you know, the absolute worst case scenarios. Um, it's just unaffordable. Uh, to have that level of, of equipment and staffing over time. So what we've tried to do is look back historically, look at the the types of snow events that we have, you know, what the response time is. We've set a goal, uh, you know, for as far as being able to get through the entire city and get it uh, plowed at least once to, to get things going. And then we try to staff uh, to meet that goal and to plan for that. Now, when we have events like we did last April, where we have a big snowstorm and followed in rapid succession by another snow event, 
um, or some of these things drag on and we have a, lot, a big wind event to go with it, it can definitely impact the, you know, how, how quickly we're able to turn that around. But if we had enough manpower and equipment to plow every street in town in within 24 hours, it would just be unaffordable uh, to do that. Uh, the second question revolved around, uh, you know, planning a logical plan to manage street repair. Um, you know, there is a lot of thought and planning uh, that goes into the street repair and maintenance uh, part of the budget. And a lot of these projects have funding from other sources, uh, state and federal sources. So those projects are, are often three or four or five years out into the future. Um, so when that funding becomes available, that project uh, is given a green light and we move forward with that. The rest of the normal maintenance projects, you know, we look at other things that we would be taking a look at if there's any utilities that need to be upgraded in those area. Obviously, the condition of the pavement, how long it's been since that, that street has had uh, any maintenance, the, what kind of traffic is on it, um, all of those different types of things. And, you know, they try to prioritize based on the need and where it makes the most sense to do those types of projects. Um, it's pretty difficult just to go into, uh, you know, a certain section of town and just replace all of the streets uh, in that part of town because they wear differently, uh, you know, obviously depending on lots of lots of circumstances, the traffic, the original construction of the road, whether there's any storm sewers in that part of town. So there's lots of, of different variables that go into place with deciding where the, the projects are going to be. Yeah, and I know engineering staff looks at things that uh, like flood control. There's streets that they want to replace, but they know that flood control is coming and that could beat up some of those roads they want to replace. So they want to wait until all those truckloads of concrete and dirt are moved over the road before they have to rip it up and, and mill and overlay or do a complete restructuring. So they do look at a lot of those aspects. There's so much planning involved in that. It's uh, unfathomable at times. So um, thanks, Dave. I appreciate you bringing, bringing that uh, in for some enlightenment. Okay. I think that satisfies just about every question we've received thus far. Again, if you have more of them, you can send us a line uh, through our social media pages. Um, we will try to answer everything you can. You could contact your city council members as well um, uh, for anything well, uh, under the sun regarding the city government, including the 2023 budget. Again, a workshop coming up on Wednesday at five o'clock. Here's Harold once again. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Uh, I appreciate it. This was four of these that we haven't done these before, but I hope um, you guys found these valuable and I hope the public especially found them valuable as well. That'll do it for us. Have a good afternoon. We'll be back on Wednesday, I suppose, with a budget workshop. Thank you.